All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Finding the Needle in a Big Haystack. We're going to be talking about uh, integrating search with Hadoop. Um, this is a two-person talk, so I'll let Wolfgang start off with uh, a little bit of his bio real quick, and I'll take over. All right, uh, my name is Wolfgang, Wolfgang Hoshek, and I'm a search engineer at the Cladera search team. Um, you know, I previously worked in various different places, including in Europe at uh, CERN, at the European uh, Research Center for Particle Physics. I worked at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and uh, then in uh, various startups in the Bay Area, including SkyTide, for example. And what all of these things have in common is that, you know, I worked with, uh, you know, large amounts of data, making sense out of them, building BI servers, uh, uh, building uh, worldwide uh, analytic systems that crunch a lot of data and uh, produce, uh, you know, real-time results in the end, you know, after a considerable amount of uh, trials and errors. And um, I'm also an Apache Solar Lucene committer from uh, way back in the day. Uh, I'm a Flume committer, uh, I'm committer on the HBase Indexer project. We'll hear more on, on that later, on Kite and Morphlands and so forth. And so without much further ado, I'll hand it over to Mark, who's going to talk about some more. Yeah, so a uh, quick introduction to me. Uh, my name's Mark Miller. I'm a Lucene Solar committer. I've been playing around with Lucene since 2006. Been a committer since around 2008. Uh, previously, I worked for LucidWorks, which uh, is the commercial entity uh, behind, or attempts to be the commercial entity behind Lucene and Solar. Uh, I was the core engineering manager there for a couple of years, and uh, currently I'm a software engineer at Cloudera, uh, co-creator of Solar Cloud with uh, Yannick Seely, uh, which is uh, Solar's clustering and, and distributed capabilities. Um, so a little bit of uh, the agenda. Uh, first, we're going to talk about big data and search, kind of setting the stage. Uh, the Cloudera search architecture, um, some near real time and batch use cases, and then finally, conclusion and uh, QA. So uh, first, the Enterprise Data Hub. This is kind of uh, Cloudera's vision of, of the future for, for handling big data. Uh, the idea is basically that you have all of your data in one place on HDFS, and you bring in various processes to, to, to deal with that data. Uh, allows you to store you know a ton of ton of data on commodity hardware very cheaply, and then you know bring the processing to the data rather than moving the data around. Um, so, you know you can see where search fits fits into this. This is kind of taking uh, the the single node model where where you need you want to be able to store data, you want to be able to process data, and uh, of course you also want to be able to search data. Um, so Hadoop uh, obviously deals with the storing and processing of data. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this is a talk about bringing search to that, to that ball game. Um, so the idea of adding search is uh, that search tends to be easy. Everybody knows search. You see a Google box and uh, it's pretty clear what to do. Type in some search terms, hit return, uh, and you get your results back. So, you know, um, uh, dealing with MapReduce kind of takes an expert. You're generally kind of a low-level programmer. You've got to understand some of the distributed paradigms. Uh, you know, you, you kind of got to be an expert. SQL brings things up a level. It's a little easier. A lot of people know SQL, but, but generally not everybody knows SQL. Search, uh, you know, everybody knows search. Everybody knows how to search Google. So bringing search to Hadoop kind of opens up uh, the range of what Hadoop can do for people uh, to, a, to a much wider audience. Um, so what is Cloudera Search? Uh, it's, it's basically full text search with faceted navigation. Um, we allow for, for both you know, efficient batch search, uh, batch indexing, uh, near real time search, where basically data is coming in and being indexed while people are searching for that data with, with very low latency from when it comes in to when you can search it, on demand indexing. Um, so how we chose to integrate search to Hadoop was to integrate with uh, Apache Solar. Uh, Hadoop being an Apache project, it's kind of a nice marriage to bring in Solar, which is also Apache-based, uh, very similar communities, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, very similar architectures and how things are, are configured. Um, has a very established, uh, mature community. Solar's been around since about 2006, uh, so it's, it's, it's been, uh, you know, fairly hardened over time. Although some of the distributed stuff is, is a little newer. Um, it started out as a, a single box solution. Uh, and now people are using it, you know, up to, to hundreds of boxes in some cases. Um, so basically, the, the idea to integrate search, uh, you know, what, what do we do first? We basically decided, you know, let's do some first 
world-class integrations with the rest of the Hadoop ecosystem. So let's integrate Solar with MapReduce. Let's integrate Solar with uh, HBase. Let's integrate Solar with Flume. All of these kind of well-known uh, Hadoop projects. Um, let's you know contribute back to to each of these open source projects all of these integration points to make it really easy to to add search um, to what everybody's already doing with Hadoop. Um, so we're using 100% solar. Um, it's all you know unmodified open source solar. We don't really have anything proprietary. We're just taking what's already out there and, and integrating it with the rest of these projects. Um, so the, the Cloudera Search architecture overview. Um, in, in the middle there, you have the Solar Cloud cluster. Cloudera Search only works in Solar Cloud mode. Uh, solar basically has two modes. One, which is kind of the old mode, uh, is, is mostly a single box uh, solution. It did, it did offer previously distributed search, but it was up to you to kind of index the data yourself to deal with failover or fault tolerance. Um, it was really easy to search across multiple boxes, but you know there was a lot of do-it-yourself glue to, to make that work well. Solar Cloud kind of adds a lot of the cluster and high availability and automatic failover that uh, a lot of people kind of had to used to build themselves. Now you get it out of the box. Um, so as you can see, we, we've done integrations both uh, with HDFS so that Solar Cloud will run natively on HDFS rather than on the local file system. Uh, integration with HBase so that as you're indexing uh, data to HBase, uh, that, that can immediately be available for search. Uh, as well as Flume, data can come into Flume and, and be piped off into Solar along with you know, whatever other syncs you have like HDFS. Um, and then it's basically a high-level overview. We'll kind of dig into some of these. Uh, another great integration is with uh, Hue. He was a graphical interface into a lot of the Hadoop projects. And it's added some really great support for Solar, where you can kind of uh, generate these really quick uh, GUI search uh, integrations where you can do drag and drop to, to kind of create a whole interface for searching and, and uh, having facets on the side where you just you know, drag over. This is where I want my facets. This is the fields I want to facet on. Um, if you haven't checked out Hue, really, really awesome interface into a lot of Hadoop projects. And, and the, the job they've done integrating with Solar is, is pretty amazing. So some of the challenges we had in doing this integration, um, you know, uh, uh, making it very scalable, very reliable, um, that's, that's kind of still an ongoing process, but, but we've done a lot of work to, to improve this. Just the fact that we uh, run natively on HDFS adds a lot of reliability because HDFS is very hardened, uh, stable, you know, has its own replication. Um, it's, it's been around long enough and banged on long enough by, by many, you know, large organizations, people doing stuff with a lot of data. So it's, it's, it's just uh, very solid. Um, and, and adds uh, an, an extra layer of, of reliability. Um, you're not likely to, to, you know, to have a corrupt index or lose any data. Um, we wanted to, to provide near real-time search at a, at a very large scale. You know, people dealing with Hadoop are generally dealing with terabytes or petabytes of data. So uh, you know, we want to be able to be able to ingest data at a very high volume while still providing near real-time search. Um, at the same time, we want to be able to index a lot of data very fast. You know, if you can't index that fast and you're dealing with terabytes of data, then, uh, you know, search is, is kind of useless. You don't want to take a year to be able to put in your, your terabytes of data. So uh, that's, that's really where kind of our MapReduce integration comes in, where you can use your, you know, 400 node MapReduce cluster to, to build indexes and deploy them to Solar Cloud. And then uh, another issue was usability. Uh, there's, there's kind of been uh, a, a lot of usability issues in terms of getting solar and solar cloud up to speed. Uh, the community has focused a lot on some of the, uh, the core problems that are kind of deeper and more technical and, and not as much on the usability. So as, as we were doing these integrations, we spent a lot of time uh, making the usability a little better. We worked on a tool called Solar Control that makes it a lot easier to kind of manage configuration and, and creating and collections and adding replicas and things like that. Um, so we spent a lot of time kind of in improving the usability. So uh, a little bit about uh, Apache Lucene and Solar, which is what we're integrating in. Uh, Lucene is a, a full text search library, extremely fast, extremely compact, extremely efficient. Um, probably most of you have heard of it. It's, it's pretty much the de facto standard for search these days. Uh, easily the best open source uh, search library, I think. Uh, I used to work a lot more on Lucene. It's, it's an extremely fun project to work on, has a fantastic community. 
Um, I spend a lot more time on solar now. Uh, solar is basically a, a search engine built on top of Lucene that adds things like uh, highlighting, faceted search, spell checking, uh, the distributed capabilities that come with Solar Cloud. So kind of like the, the next layer up. Um, and then, uh, so Solar Cloud itself, this, this was basically an, in, an, an initiative started in 2009 um, that, that is basically attempting to make large scale distributed search easier. Like I said before, Solar, even back in like 2007, could do distributed search, but it was up to you to figure out how to get your data on all the individual nodes. Um, Solar Cloud basically starts doing that automatically for you. You just start adding data to the cluster. It figures out where to put the data by hashing it. And uh, it kind of handles, you know, if a node goes down, how to deal with that and, and, and uh, provide fault tolerant search. Um, yeah, so, so basically one of the first things we started working on was uh, making solar so that it could natively work with HDFS. This was uh, fairly important to, to Cloudera because pretty much all of their um, systems run on HDFS and you really don't want to introduce a new component that relies on local file system storage because it's just a new level of complexity in terms of dealing with configuration and management. You know, you've got to look at each node and you've got to make sure they all have the right amount of file system space and if you're running out of space, you've got to deal with each of those nodes and, and add more space. Once you're running on HDFS, that becomes much less of a headache. You can use existing tools and management applications just to add more uh, space to your HDFS cluster, and, and it's kind of less of a management headache. You get some other benefits by running off, running off HDFS. Let's say you want to use MapReduce to, to build indexes. You can Im immediately start serving those indexes straight from HDFS with Solar without having to like copy them off to the local file system, uh, a practice that, that was pretty common in the past. Um, you also can do some cool things in terms of failover that I'll talk about a little more. Um, so the HDFS integration, um, there's a, a low-level Lucene directory abstraction that allows you to basically plug in uh, a new class so that you can uh, write a Lucene or read a Lucene index uh, from almost anything uh, if, if you implement this directory structure. So. What we did is uh, there's a project called Apache Blur that kind of uh, you know, headed the way in this. And they, they implemented what's called an HDFS directory, which knows how to read and write directly to HDFS. So uh, you know, we talked to them, and we ended up borrowing this code. Uh, there, there can be some performance issues uh, reading and writing to HDFS. It's, it's actually faster than you think, but in some cases, uh, the, the reads can be slower than you'd like. So they also introduced uh, what's called a block cache so that uh, when you're doing reads, you know, it'll read a lot more and cache it locally. Uh, you, can, you can do this off heap as well using uh, direct buffers to, to make sure you're not uh, running into garbage collection issues and you don't have to size your heap uh, really huge. Uh, this, this block cache is basically a replacement for the local file system cache in a lot of cases. Um, so you, you tend to want it to be uh, a ton of RAM and having it off heap just basically makes that a lot more efficient. Um, so <sighs> Let's see. So basically, in Solar, there's a directory factory abstraction that lets you plug in different Lucene directory implementations. In the past, there's actually only one that really worked well with Solar, and that was the local file system uh, implementation. And so like, if you wanted to do replication or some of the other more advanced features in Solar, if only worked if you had this local file system implementation. So one of the first things we did is we started expanding Solar so that it could actually do replication and all of these things with any uh, valid directory implementation. Uh, so that let us basically add this HDFS implementation and still take advantage of replication, which is pretty important for Solar Cloud. When a node goes down and you bring it back up later, it's got to replicate from uh, you know, an existing node that already has the data. Uh, so basically, we, we kind of borrowed this HDFS directory implementation. We plugged it into Solar. We kind of spruced it up to make it work a little better with Solar. There were a couple oddities that, that didn't really fit with our architecture. Um, but we spruced it up. We got all that to work pretty well. There's still some optimizations we want to do, but we found performance was actually fairly similar to a local file system. Uh, Solar Cloud also has a transaction log. 
so that if a node goes down, if it crashes, when it starts back up, it can replay from the transaction log and not lose any data. This was also written to the local file system. And so having that in the local file system, again, the same as having your index on the local file system kind of added a management headache. So we also created new implementation for that that can write the transaction log directly to HDFS. Uh, there's, there's kind of some side benefits in this in that if you only have, if you have no replicas and you only have one node serving a shard and that shard goes down, you can actually bring that shard up on another node and still have the transaction log to replay and, and not actually lose any data. Um, so once we implemented both of these abstractions, we basically had kind of first class support for HDFS with Solar. When you start up Solar, you can pass a couple of system properties and, and basically be writing all of your data other than the logs uh, to HDFS. So auto, auto replica failover. This is kind of uh, actually one of the great things to come out of running on HDFS. Um, so when you're running on HDFS, if a node goes down, uh, that, that data is actually still available on HDFS. So in the standard uh, local file system case, if a node goes down, you have to have a replica still around to fall over to, right? And then uh, you can add more replicas, and they'll replicate the index from the existing replica to get back up to speed. But if you lose all of your replicas for a shard, you're kind of dead in the water. You're not going to be able to serve um, you know, one part of your index until someone comes in and manually brings those machines back up. Um, so this is a feature that I'm actually currently working on. It's not finished, but it's, it's pretty close. It's going to be in soon. And, and what this lets you do is even if you lose every replica in your shard, because that data is still served in HDFS, you can actually recreate a core, a solar core on a machine that's still up, and it can start serving that data um, from that shard. And, and, and this is kind of a big advantage to the local file system in that you can, you, you know, you can essentially, if you start with 30 nodes and you go down to only one node up and all the rest die, you can essentially fall over to serving your entire index from that one node. In most cases, it's, it's not going to be performant to go down to one node, but you know, it's, it's just kind of cool that, that basically uh, it's, it's you know, fault tolerant down to pretty much any level because the data is always available in HDFS and it just takes um, starting up a solar core on an existing machine to start serving it again. Um, now I'll pass over to Wolfgang to talk about a couple of the other integrations. All right, uh, so let's talk a little bit about more on the ingestion side. So we have some integration points you know, for near real-time indexing uh, into solar using uh, Apache Flume as an ingestion system. Uh, Flume is uh, you know, one of the projects that's part of the Hadoop uh, ecosystem that's uh, uh, w very widely used. A lot of people use it to stream data into HDFS uh, uh, for as, an, as a near real-time mechanism to say like, you know, uh, load uh, log files that are incrementally, you know, uh, produced into HDFS. Uh, other kinds of data, not just like text data, uh, but also binary data, all sorts of things. And uh, so we took uh, Flume, and Flume uh, meaning uh, a bunch of Flume agents, and have them uh, consume data, such as log files or other kind of uh, kind of data, and then. Uh, Forward, uh, have, have this data being forwarded through uh, various Flume agents in a distributed system, you know, hierarchy or graph or tree shape like form uh, into Solar and into HDFS. Starting from the notion initially that uh, all data uh, lands in HDFS pretty much unmodified. So that is for, have for a very long time has been like the, 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 the common mode of operating uh, Hadoop uh, that whatever data gets ingested uh, pretty much gets stored in its raw form without li with little or no uh, formatting or transformation. And uh, so given that, what we had to do is find a way how to take that data in near real time and also stuff it into solar. But as you uh, will of course know, it doesn't make too much sense to, to store raw data in solar, but rather that data needs to conform to some uh, search application model that actually makes sense. And so there is some uh, some uh, some a step in between that needs to be done in order to uh, convert the data from A to B into you know into the format that is actually makes sense uh, for a search application. And so um, Flume is a very modular system. You can plug yourself in at various levels and very various different points. And the, the most natural point for plugging in this uh, solar ingestion mechanism is at the sync level, where you have something ca called a, a Flume Morphline Solar Sync, which is essentially a plug-in point. 
that, uh, that can take a stream of data and then transform uh, that data into uh, whatever data model is required by Solar and then uh, send it uh, via SolarJ, standard uh, Solar uh, API, into, into Solar for indexing. And uh, uh, you can pipe the very same data also into HDFS. So it's, it, you, usually people use this you know, to stream data into both targets rather than into one target. They retain the ability to have all of their data in uh, HDFS in its raw form. So later on, you can run arbitrary processing over it. You can change your mind. You might not even know today what you're going to do with your uh, data a year from now. So you have all the flexibility that traditionally Hadoop, Hadoop, Hadoop gives you because you have the raw data in HDFS. But you also have for what is currently today, the best to the best of our knowledge, you know, what's, what's the most meaningful way how to index that data in solar and make it available to searches through that near real-time mechanism. So it's not an either or, but it's a, you know, both of these things are available to you and typically people use both in combination. Um, then uh, Flume is also reliable in the sense that, you know, you can fail over between hosts that uh, uh, go down. Uh, you can also scale out in that uh, you, you can, can partition it so many nodes can work on subsets of the input data at the same time. So this is a scalable and reliable ingestion system that uh, works very well. And uh, the way it gets configured is by a little configuration file that refers to uh, what we call a Morphline configuration file, yet another configuration file that essentially in some uh, DSL, small little DSL type like form specifies how to input data, you know, whether it's a log line or whether it's a, you know, a photo or whether it's a Microsoft Word document or maybe it's like some clickstream data or whatever it may be, how it gets transformed. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, people told us, you know, would be really interesting and really very valuable is to make a, uh, HBase be uh, able to, uh, to, to to search or to, uh, is to is to make a, a system that can uh, search uh, data that's stored in HBase. So uh, HBase is you know a NoSQL store that is different from HDFS in that you know you can update data in it, which you can't in HDFS very easily. Uh, so um, uh, it's a it's a it's a storage manager if you, if you like that you can be used for OLTP updates and so these OLTP updates you know uh, should be able uh, should sh uh, should be able to to get s searched take like for example you know an online shopping store or something like an eBay type like system or so you can imagine that people as they update their data into database you know uh, other applications would like to search that data and they would rather like to do that in near real time rather than say like an hour down the road or maybe a day down the road. And so we came up with this way of uh, plugging ourselves into HBase in one particular way that allows us to do this in a non-intrusive way, meaning that we don't uh, actually uh, perturb you know, the reliability and the, and the performance of, the, of HBase itself and the applications that uh, do updates in HBase. And we plugged ourselves in in a way that's fairly flexible so you can specify how uh, exactly, you know, the data should be indexed and transformed on the way it scales in that uh, you can uh, horizontally scale it out and use any number of nodes and processes to uh, do that kind of indexing step. And it's also reliable in that, uh, you know, no data will ever get lost. Uh, and so uh, the, the data that hasn't been delivered yet to the indexing system will be retried and it will eventually make it into solar. So you can keep your solar index uh, consistent with the HBase index uh, as long as you allow for a little bit of lag. So in other words, this is an eventually consistent system, not a system that is immediately consistent. And the reason why is because for search applications, more often than not, indeed in the overwhelming uh, uh, percentage of cases, this is good enough. It's good enough to be eventually consistent as long as you will be consistent uh, uh, you know, in a fairly reasonable amount of time. And the strong consistency is not required. This allow is the key feature that allows us to uh, uh, put ourselves outside of the right path of HBase, so we don't, so we don't uh, impact you know the reliability and the performance of the primary application that applies updates to HBase. Again, uh, this uh, uh, component called the Lily HBase index that I've been describing is configured through uh, this uh, little configuration file called Morphline configuration file. This DSL that where you can say like you know, take that HBase cell or that HBase row, and here's how you transform it into a solar input document or, you know, it kind of conforms to the Lucene data model and, 
you know what what the data what the data actually is that you want to index and in, index in solar for that HBIS cell and how it should be analyzed and so forth. Uh, this is actually work that we've done with our good colleagues at NG Data. Uh, we were very, very happy to find out that they had uh, goals that were very similar to ours, and so we set out to do this uh, together as an open source project. It's available on GitHub under, uh, an, uh, under the Apache license. You're welcome to check that out and chime in and help us uh, move this forward. Uh, it's essentially you know, implemented as a, a listener to the replication uh, API that HBase has had for a very long time, and that is by now very much hardened and reliable and uh, in, 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 in any heavy use by uh, many customers. So we pretend, so HBase has this API where you can say, where similar to say My, MySQL or Oracle or indeed any, uh, any other database, you can listen in to the, to the OLTP updates that uh, are applied to the base table, you know, and so that replication API essentially plays back, you know, all the edits that, that uh, happen to to, uh, to HBase, and we just simply, uh, you know, plug ourselves in at, at that level and pretend to be a secondary HBase cluster, uh, you know, which we are not, but we just pretend to be uh, an HBase region server or a set of region servers, and, uh, by, by, and by, by doing so, we receive all the updates that go through the uh, write-ahead log in HBase, and uh, so based on that information, we, rather than store it, the data into, into uh, yet another secondary HBase, we store it in solar, you know, after having transformed it using this uh, this morph line uh, uh, ETL step. All right. So um, after having uh, this, uh, I should um, I should mention also that um, we we early on we decided that you know well, you know Hadoop traditionally comes from comes uh, uh, from a world of batch, for from a world of massive massively scalable batch processing. And near relative was going to be important uh, moving forward and becoming more and more and more more important over time, but the need for batch isn't going to go away anytime soon. And indeed, you know, my impression is that it will never go away. And then the more near real time processing you do as a side effect, the more data you're going to store and keep, you know, in, perhaps in some historic archive in HDFS. And the more important actually a scale, a scalable batch processing is is going to be. So batch isn't going uh, going away at all. And we need to support batch in a, in a performant way. It's just a, a fact of life that batch processing is more cost effective you know, per, uh, uh, per unit uh, of, 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 of data item than the near real time in a, uh, processing could ever be. So batch was, remains very important. And so we integrated solar uh, and MapReduce. And the result is you know, a system that, again, is very flexible in that you can specify how your data should be transformed and uh, 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 massaged into something that Solar understands. Uh, it's scalable in that you can take advantage of all the mapper slots and reducer slots that you have on your HBS cluster, uh, on your um, MapReduce cluster, which can be, you know, very very large. Even though you might your Solar installation might not be so so large, you can still take uh, take advantage of your uh, big uh, uh, MapReduce cluster that maybe is you know also used for other purposes, and you will just use it for some massive indexing step for uh, for a little while, and then hand it off, hand it back to some 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 other uh, tenants on that cluster. And so in this way, by massively parallelizing the indexing step in some reliable way, which is what uh, you know MapReduce basically stands for, uh, you know we we. We, we allow people the flexibility to re-index their data without having to wait for a year, which is completely unacceptable, or to change their mind later about how their, you know, their index should really look like. And so they, they're able to iterate you know, on their data model without it being uh, pro prohibitive. And so the other interesting uh, thing about combining uh, batch and near real time is that you, using this, you can implement something like a Lambda architecture where you, you, know, you index, you know, uh, you know the last year of data that you that you that you have using MapReduce into Solar, and then going forward, you know the the most recent data that streams in through some online system uh, with updates that happen, you know, uh, yeah, that that happen immediately. Though uh, this this data can be ingested in near real time using Flume directly into Solar, so you can combine those two approaches. To uh, you know, to index say 99% of your data using MapReduce, and the remaining remaining 1%, which is the, the percent that's in, that's generated right now, 
in near real time, put them all into uh, you know, the same solar uh, cloud cluster, and then uh, answer queries that combine the historic data and the most recent data uh, using a uniform interface. So uh, that's uh, uh, fairly interesting. Uh, so the, the way it w uh, you can also you can uh, index data that's in HDFS, uh, just plain files, whatever files they may be, uh, whether it's sequence files or text files or whether it's parquet files or whether it's arrow files or you know some other uh, arbitrary data format, uh, or you can you know uh, index HBase tables using MapReduce in this uh, in this scalable batch uh, indexing step. So the way it works is that. Uh, essentially, a bunch of mappers get fired off. They munch, uh, you know, take 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 a subset of the input files, you know, transform the data, produce uh, solar input documents. You know, they get sent off to a bunch of reducers, which run, you know, like uh, on that MapReduce cluster. The reducers actually each reducer is uh, like a small little, uh, you know, solar shard in its own way, like a micro shard. Uh, it's, uh, it's 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 a fully fully functional solar server that just happens to be instantiated temporarily, indexes its data, writes it to HDFS, and then when all the reducers are finished, you can optionally you know merge a large number of uh, shards into a smaller number of shards, meaning the the number of shards that you desire for your solar for your solar cluster, and then you can uh, using a go live step merge those segments, merge those indexes into uh, the solar cloud uh, as an as a final step. And that final step is optional. You don't have to do that. If you're happy to just bring up your solar service in the way Mark already suggested, that just like read data from HDFS, you can do that too. Or you know, using that go live step, you can merge uh, the data into a live customer facing uh, a solar cloud cluster. Um, I already talked about most of these things here. Um, one of the interesting things, and like a little bit more on the technical side, is that you know, indeed, you can use more reducers that you have solar shards doing the indexing. This is pretty interesting because it turns out that uh, you know indexing is a, by by and large a CPU bound step. So it makes sense to use all of the CPU cores that you have your uh, available in your cluster if that's what you desire you know, according to your you know your uh, your administration and uh, and policies. If that's what you desire to 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 do the indexing, so you can use all reducer slots on your cluster if you want uh, to do the indexing. And then there's a final merging step to merge the segments into a smaller number of segments, which is comparatively uh, less expensive than the indexing uh, in, the, in, 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 in the reducers itself. So this is why this works in such a scalable manner. Much more scalable than you know, uh, having a mapper-only job that would send the data directly using SolarJ into a, um, a solar cloud cluster. All right, a uh, couple of minutes on the little library that we uh, that we developed, you know, for that purpose. There's a little library for extraction, transformation, and loading uh, in a streaming manner that we developed. It's called Kite Morphlines. It's a Morphland lib. It's a Java library uh, that uh, that was developed as part of the Cloudera Search project. And since we uh, uh, found out, you know, that it's actually applicable in other contexts as well, we, you know, sort of like. Uh, uh, um, uh, moved it out of Cloudera Search and, and put it into a general purpose reusable forum such as uh, Kite. And the way it works is like, you know, it's, a, it's actually very simple. It's a Java library that allows you to take, any, take data from any kind of data source and uh, process it in whatever arbitrary way and then send the results you know, into some kind of target and whatever that target may be, you can, you can, you can plug yourself in there. Typically it's solar or it's HDFS or it might be HBase or you know, whatever. And so uh, at its core, it's basically a chain of commands that take some input data. It's just like similar to Unix pipelines, you know, at least conceptually. Take some, you know, each of the components takes some input data, munches it, spits something out. And the next component, you know, again, takes the output of the previous component, munches it in some way, transforms it, uh, you know, does something with it, and you know, maybe cleans the data or annotates it, you know, and then sends it to the next command. And uh, that, that command might be a command that, uh, that actually uh, sends the data into solar. You know, such as the load solar command. So, using this um, this mechanism, people are able to uh, describe, you know, like uh, so, uh, item uh, one item at a time type like transformations in a very simple way. And uh, uh, lots of people are using this, uh, especially because it doesn't actually require any kind of you know sophisticated prog programming. It's you know, it's a DSL that can be used, but just simply by editing a configuration file. And so, it's fairly approachable and easy. Uh, to get started with, and uh, people have had lots of success uh, indexing data in you know in in various manners. 
without actually having to be Java programmers. Uh, brief slide to mention that you, know, you could use, use this library not just to, in, to, to send data into Solar Cloud, but into your own application. It really you know, has uh, no dependency on Solar Cloud uh, at all, except for that there is one optional module you know, for Solar, and you know, that module is uh, responsible to implement the commands you know, that relate to loading data into Solar, but all the other commands you know, are in different uh, Maven modules, and so you can use this independently for other search servers, if too, if, you, if that's what you wanted to do. Um, here's a brief example uh, of a Morphline configuration file uh, that, you know, say, assume you have a simple line, you know, from some textual log file, the typical kind of thing that has, you know, like a date in there and maybe some, a, a bunch of strings that relate to who, what process wrote this stuff, the syslogd or something like this, and a, and a message or so in some semi, semi informal, uh, you know, uh, format, and you'd like to extract, you know, a bunch of fields out of this. Uh, you know, so like the priority, timestamp, hostname, so forth and so forth. People usually reside to uh, regular expressions to, to parse this stuff in more or less nasty manners out of these text uh, files that have, that have never been, you know, implemented, you know, with much of an API in mind. And so there's one command such as, that's called grok, and you can specify there some rules as to, uh, you know, how, some regular expressions as to how to extract the data out of that text line and where a field starts and where it stops and so forth. Basically, the way it works is like it's like a, it's like a convenient uh, you know, user interface to regular expressions. You, you don't specify a regular expression by writing it down, but rather by specify a regular expression by name. In this case, like say like positive integer or syslog timestamp or syslog host. And that really is a regular expression that's in some external configuration file that you don't have to write that somebody else already wrote. So you can reuse regular expressions simply by you know, using them by name. And you might be familiar with this because this is actually, uh, as a matter of fact, precisely what Logstash does. And we felt free you know, to adopt you know, this great idea that the Logstash people had. And uh, you know, we provide exactly the same kind of feature set that, that Logstash uses you know, to, to do this. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a great idea, and we're very happy to to take advantage of, of, of that. Uh, similarly, there are commands say like to you know split a file into records. You know, in case uh, when, when records are uh, uh, spread across multiple lines and you don't process them line by line, but rather you know multi-line things. So there's a, a, a variety of, uh, of 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 commands in there for all sorts of purposes that uh, you can you can pick up and sort of sort of satisfies the 80/20 rule. And if there's stuff that isn't part of the, 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 the predefined you know, functionality set, you, know, you can extend it in the, the library in a bunch of ways. The easiest way is to just write some Java code as a snippet, sort of like directly inline in that configuration file, and it gets compiled on the fly you know, as the program runs, and then you know, gets compiled in the regular Java uh, bytecode, you know, and then uh, executed at runtime. And so you can, if, if, if your, all your logic is like lowercasing some strings, you know, or doing a little bit of, uh, you know, processing one or two or three or four or five lines of Java, it's entirely, you know, uh, rational to just uh, uh, dump a little bit of Java code right into the configuration file and so that gets, gets executed and takes care of your custom functionality. Um, there is, a, as I try to hint at, you know, uh, the usual, there's commands for the usual suspects in the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, like uh, parquet files, ARA files, CSV, and text, and so forth, JSON, XML, and then uh, you know we also import uh, the Tika project. So whatever parses are available as part of Tika, you can use those too. So you know there um, there are thousands of parses out there that you don't want to write. Trust me, but uh, you know you can take advantage you know of Tika, which which has already done you know a large fraction of the hard work out there, and so we reuse that. As I mentioned, HBase, row cells. And uh, importantly, you can also write your own commands, of course. So you can plug in your own command, and then that command does. It's just a regular Java class. You know, it takes like you know ten lines of code, and does whatever you want. So um, that's essentially the idea behind uh, Morphlands. Uh, a bunch of other things, you know, like geo support, uh, geo support uh, you know, and so forth. You know, I'm not going to go to detail of that. The way it works is uh, in, uh, regarding performance is that a very simple approach, similar to the MapReduce approach. You know. Each morph line is really uh, compiled on the fly and runs in a single thread. All the commands 
run in the very same single thread. And so handing off data from one command to the other is truly just a Java method call. There's no serialization in between. There's no queue in between. There's no thread context switches, no nothing. It's just like you know one object calling another object with nothing in between. This is the reason why this is really fast. And so the way you get, you get scale out is by simply running many instances of the morph line, typically one per CPU core or two per CPU core among, uh, on, on many nodes. So that's a typical kind of you know, uh, embarrassingly parallel processing model. Okay. And then, uh, as uh, Mark already hinted, you know, there's a nice U UI that uh, sits on top of it. That, uh, that you will use, presumably, to get started. Super easy to get started, very, very sweet and sexy. Uh, but eventually, you might actually end up with your own UI, and you, know, you, can, you, know, of course you don't have to use that. You know, any so solar application that runs on standard solar will also run on Cloud Air Search, and so there's, there's like no locking or anything like this, but this is a good starting point. And we also integrated uh, uh, search with a security infrastructure called uh, Apache Sentry. And uh, so we worked on cluster level access control, index level access control. Uh, you know, the latest thing is document level access control. And then going forward, there is going to be some work on field level access control as, as well to, to make sure that only subsets of data are available to the right kind of people with the right kind of, uh, in the right kind of roles and permissions. And then you know, uh, the way it gets managed is through Cloud Air Manager. I think that you know, like, I mean, the, the basic the basic scale-out proposition is that you can scale out your data in your cluster and whatever it is that you're doing by a factor X, say a factor 10, a factor 100, without actually having to employ 10 times more people or 100 times more people. That's, you know, if you'd have to hire you know, X times more people to do uh, you know, X times more, more data work, you know, that's just a red flag. It's not going to happen. And so Cloudera Manager is like the Cloudera answer to this, you know, where we say, like, you, know, you can operate and manage you know, your cluster without having to, you know, employ a huge amount of new human resources. And so in, in doing so, you'll save a lot of time and effort. And uh, so that's about it. You can try this out. You know, uh, there's a new uh, project that w recently went live called Cloudera Live. That's maybe the, uh, the easiest uh, way to get started is basically just, you know, an online website. You know, for, Hadoop are already running and instantiated, and you can uh, with some a bunch of s sample data sets and all of the you know services already up and running, and you can just click around there and you know do your own your own thing and try it out, and then maybe you know later on try virtual machine or whatever. So it's a, you know, a new easy way to to, to see uh, how it all works in practice. All right, thanks very much. I think we've used up our time. I hope. We have still have time for some questions, you know, considering that this is the last session, so we get the, a little bit of an advantage over everybody else out there. <laughs> okay, questions? Are you planning to run solar on Yarn as well, or is it a standalone daemon? We're, we're thinking. We're th wow, we're thinking about it. Um, uh, at this time, you know, we're not running on Yarn precisely because, you know, uh, as you know, like people usually ex expect uh, Solo to give you know results in pretty much millisecond time frame, you know, very very low latency results, you know, for interactive queries, and uh, you know, integrating you know Solar with a resource management system that's more heavyweight. So in integrating into a system that, that's more heavyweight, such as Yarn, is a, is a bit of a challenge. So at this point, we are not providing Yarn integration, but we're exploring and considering you know, like how, what the best way to move forward is. Definitely, the idea is that we integrate in a resource control system. At this point in time, it is really just in log at the operating system uh, level, you know, where you know you statically partition, uh, you know, the resources rather than dynamically, because there's just simply no not enough time to switch in a millisecond time frame. Um. Yeah, it's maybe one for Mark, but uh, you mentioned that Solar on HDFS had before. Hello? Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, 
One for Mark. Uh, you, you mentioned that Solar and HDFS had performance fairly similar to the local file system. C could you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, I mean, we haven't done um, the extensive testing to where I, I, I'd be willing to give like conclusive numbers, but in kind of my like, you know, uh, kind of off the cuff testing, I've generally seen, uh, you know, maybe a 10 to 15% performance loss. Uh, although there's, there's a lot of optimizations that we haven't done yet. Uh, you know, we haven't turned on like, uh, you know, short circuit reads. Um, we haven't, uh, there's various kind of coding optimizations. Uh, actually, uh, one of our HDFS guys, Todd Lipkin, uh, was looking through some of the code that we did and he had various ideas uh, for some speed ups. So uh, right now it's actually been uh, pretty close, but we think that, that we'll be able to pretty much match it. In a lot of cases too, because people using Hadoop tend to have like 12 drives and HDFS kind of stripes across that, um, you can actually uh, see greater performance, although then it's not really an, an apples to apples comparison. Um, so there is some overhead. Uh, our goal is, is to actually you know, uh, meet uh, local file system performance exactly, and, and we think with, with a couple changes we can eventually get there. We've de definitely focused more on, on kind of stability and initial features over performance so far, though. Okay, uh, and a follow-up question. With, do you think you'll ever support SSDs as well as, or kind of split HDFS to get kind of faster disk I.O. Um, for, for the solar instances, or will it all be on a single HDFS? Wolfgang's uh, big into the SSDs. So there's nothing that prevents you today to you know configure and 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 provision an HDFS cluster sitting on SSDs if that's what you want to do. Um, I do know that uh, going forward, you know, people are thinking about you know introducing our HSM hierarchical storage management into the, into Hadoop, where you know you could uh, you know combine you know uh, spindles, you know rotating disk and SSDs and RAM and perhaps you know, non-volatile memory and or other storage tiers, you know, somewhere somewhere in between. Uh, but that is future talk. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, have you done any uh, stats run over uh, streaming files from S3 as inputs? Because in uh, in one of the cases I am trying, like we have millions of files in S3, and it was really taking a lot of time uh, to complete a whole indexing. We don't have an, an S3 connector or something out of the box. You know, we don't provide functionality of, uh, of that. But uh, having said that, I don't anticipate, you know, that it would be uh, any, sl any slower than whatever the network link gives you or coming out of S3. And uh, one follow-up question to that, like, uh, if I'm not wrong, like, currently the MR indexer tool uh, streams the data in the Mofflin map runner. Uh, it just uh, reads the whole file and then indexes it. So why not we had a kind of a combined file input format or something because each file would not fill a whole F HDFS block so that, you know, the split allocations and other things which Hadoop provides. So if the file is being streamed, read in a streaming fashion, you know, it's not like read all into main memory and then once once it's main memory gets indexed. So it, it is read in a streaming fashion, if that's the question. Right, so the, the current production implementation is optimized for flexibility in that it allows you to, uh, to index uh, and process arbitrary input data formats, including formats that are not splittable in the, in the Hadoop sense. So like, you know, like multi-line, you, know, uh, you know, input formats, you know, where, you know, like sometimes, you know, a record is like five lines long and sometimes it's like three lines long and things like that. So, uh, or CSV files, you know, that span multiple lines, lines and so forth. But uh, so it's it, it's optimized for flexibility and it also reads you know from uh, uh, from reads one file in, in in one thread. But we also have a tool in the works you know that allows you to, to combine you know splittable input files and non-splittable input files so that spl splittable input files can be distributed uh, um, among as many tasks as there are input splits. Okay, thank you very much, and I think we move on to the party now, and you can ask some questions there. Thank you.